moving into your home. Instant loading program packs turn any color TV into an exciting game arcade. And there's more. The color computer is an educational aid, a home management tool, and up-to-the-minute electronic information service. The programmable, expandable TRS-80 color computer from $399 only at Radio Shack, the biggest name in little computers. Radio Shack understands that a computer purchase is a serious personal and business decision. But what's really important is the company behind the computer. At Radio Shack, when you buy a computer, you buy a company. A company committed to technology, service, and support. We'll be here when you need us. With a telephone hotline, training, education, and excellent service. Tandy Computers, in business, for business. Tandy, clearly superior. This is Apple's Macintosh. And this is some of the software that's being developed for Macintosh. At the rate of one new program every business day. Exactly how much software is that? We'll give you a hint. Macintosh. The computer for the rest of us. things we do. It's also the basis of a remarkable research project at IBM. This is an experimental computer system that recognizes what I say. I talk and my words appear on the computer screen. It has a business vocabulary of thousands of words and it even knows the difference between words that sound alike but have different meanings. Watch this. Right to Mrs. Wright, right now. This computer system is another example of innovation at IBM. In fact, it's the most advanced voice recognition system of its kind, period. video games nobody compares to Atari. I find in television more sophisticated and lifelike. Gentlemen, move over for my friend Vic. The Commodore Vic 20. Move over. The Commodore Vic 20 does more than your machines. It's a great computer that also plays great games like this and this and this. A computer that plays great games? Under three hundred dollars? Exactly. We, we didn't know. know. Get the Commodore Vic 20 computer for under Shoppers. The new Atari cartridge game is in. Excuse me. <laughs> uh oh. George again. <laughs> Atari's air feedback. It comes with 27 games, but that's just for starters. You can get nine cartridges, 187 games. Ooh, blackjack. <laughs> oh. I'd like an Atari. Sorry, only our demonstrators left. Mine. No, George. Mine. The new video computer system by Atari. <laughs> more games, more fun. When it comes to home computers, the Atari home computer gets high grades. I use an Atari at home, and I, I use it for word processing and to teach myself other programming languages. Well, the graphics are probably some of the best you can find. The Atari 800 computer not only allows you to play games, it also allows you to learn math and history. Only one computer lets you enjoy this library of over 2,000 enlightening and entertaining programs. Atari home computer. The more you learn, the more you can program, and there's just no end to it. I'd like to tell you about Compaq's new Portable 2 computer. It's such a marvelous machine that it would be quite unfair to compare it with another computer. So, we've decided to compare it with this fish. Now, 
The fish weighs 22 pounds, which makes it extremely portable. It will fit snugly on the passenger seat of your car or when traveling by train on the luggage rack. By coincidence, the computer weighs exactly the same. So, nothing to choose between them so far. But how much can they remember? Well, the portable 2 has a memory of 4.1 megabytes, a fair old number of megabytes, as I'm sure you'll agree. The fish, on the other hand, can't remember a thing. Hardly surprising, really, because it's stone dead. Spectre could give you a megabyte. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Anyway, I expect you've been wondering just how much IBM software this fish can run. The answer, I'm afraid, none. The compact portable 2, however, can run all IBM's most popular... Every card can be a winner. Taste the thrill of Atari. Recently, the Baldwin family played Atari Scratch and Win cards at McDonald's and won an entire deluxe home computer and video center. Mike Jr. has already taught his dad how to use the Atari 800 home computer. The Murray family played and won an Atari home video game. Now the whole family's getting the thrill of Atari. And it could happen to you. Because every card can be a winner. Well, all right, that's close enough to my timer. Let's see, what do we got here? Run through the cameras real quick. Oh, <laughs> I see my camera is upside down. Yeah, I'll fix that real quick. Um, there's my face. A little warm today, no hat. Mess up my hair. Um, that's that camera. 
the overhead bench camera. You can see I got something different sitting here today. Um, that's this camera. I've got a guest star bird camera that's like looking outside. It's a pretty sunny day. That's very out of focus. I may employ that camera in other ways. Um, yeah, okay. And then uh, we can share desktop. There we go. Conveniently enough, that's what I want to try doing today. Well, this is someone else's blog post. Let's start the music. There we go. Hopefully that's a decent volume. I, uh, I bumped up the volume a little bit. So we'll see if it uh, correctly ducks when I talk. I, I won't be able to know until I watch this bod later. But yeah, so maybe what I can do... Oops. Turn that down a little bit so it's not picked up on my mic. Yeah, that seems not picked up on my mic. Okay, so maybe what I can do is um, talk about what this thing is, because I haven't, I don't think I've streamed about this before. So this is a uh, 3018 CNC machine. Well, it's basically a toy CNC machine. Um, 3018, I think, uh, refers to the 30 centimeter by 18 centimeter work surface. These things are widely cloned. And are available for like, I don't know, 150 US dollars. Um, the main features of it are that it's got a X carriage, like an X gantry, the Y axis, bed moves back and forth, and then the head moves up and the spindle moves up and down on the Z axis. So in some ways, it's like a bed slinger printer. Um, and then the fun part, maybe I should just like carry this around. The fun part is. When you get into the right camera, yeah, so this is the spindle. It's not very high powered, but it does hold a bit and it can. Let me see, hopefully, I don't make everyone sick by moving this around. I'm just starting to learn how to use it, but it can make interesting things like, uh, you know, it can do like carving and engraving. I'm just starting to learn how to use some of the V bits for it uh, in Fusion 360. And I want to figure out how to do like more interesting s signs and figure out like how to do actual like cutting. I don't have a laser cutter, so this could be interesting as like a, a uh, laser cutter engraver, etc. The other exciting thing it can do once I learn how to do it, if I can find where I stashed them, it can do. Um, circuit board engraving. Yeah, here we go. So, like, I got all these um, copper plates. And you can kind of see a close-up of them in the corner there. These are all copper plates. And, um, and people call them PCBs, but it's technically just a circuit board. It's not printed. Um, yeah, I got, like, little copper plates and the CNC machine can carve away the bits we don't want. Kind of like etching. So I can mill circuit boards with this. And I want to do that and build a few simple little circuits. Like, I don't know, maybe I'll make a, like one of the ones I have top of mind is maybe a um, some noisemakers, like an Atari Punk console. Maybe some blinking lights. You know, some simple stuff before I try to get into anything more complicated. Um, and it's kind of neat. I got a few assorted little uh, bits for it already. But like, these are drills. I got these are kind of weirdly labeled with painter's tape, but these are V bits. Which like, they, uh, the bits are, are angled at these different, or they're cut at these different angles so they can cut V-shaped channels. Um, there's some of these, like, these are end mills, I believe is what they're called. Um, and they can just cut, they can just carve channels in, the, in wood and other materials. But the neat thing about this is it's computer controlled. 
so I can give it an exact pattern in uh, computer-aided design software, and it will just carve it out. And the nice, the neatest thing about it is, is it's dirt cheap, 150 bucks, and you can like play around with all this stuff. And I'm hoping that this can like teach me a bit about EdCam, so that if I get to a makerspace again and I can use a, a larger, because you know they have giant like bed-sized things of these, I'll know a bit more about all this. Um, I guess the first thing I want to do. Oh, but as to what I want to do in the stream, and we'll see how far I get. As this is a super cheap machine, it is missing features. And um, like you can see a few of the things I added to this. Thing. So like since I got a 3D printer, I added things like I added this uh, chain conduit kind of to like protect some of the wires. Um, I printed out some, some bed clamps for it. You know, like this thing kind of runs along and saves the wires. And down here is some chain or some clamps. Um, what else did I print for it? I printed something else for it. But... Point being, this is like a hobbyist machine, and part of the hobby is building up the parts of the machine. I, mean, I can maybe like rotate it a bit on camera. Not a very hefty machine. This is all Bakelite, I think. So it's not a very robust machine either. It supposedly can mill aluminum. Um, which I haven't tried yet. But it's not a very rigid machine, so I'm really only counting on it to do maybe like wood, acrylic. Um, in the back of my mind, I've got an idea. If I get a bunch of 3D printer scraps and kind of melt it into a sheet, maybe I can CNC engrave cut stuff from like recycled, reused 3D printer scraps. So it could be useful for a bunch of things. It is also very messy. I don't know if you can tell, but like, as I'm moving it around, there's like lots of sawdust. That's another thing the thing's missing that I need to get for it is some sort of vacuum, some sort of uh, way to clean up the sawdust and debris that's going. I'm gonna definitely need that if I start to do um, circuit board milling, because that's gonna be like fiberglass and copper dust. And I don't really want that flying around. But, for the current stream, what this thing is really missing is end stop limit switches. So this thing travels back and forth. See, maybe I could like demonstrate it. It's unplugged right now. Now let me plug this thing in. It's got a little um, USB control board back here. Maybe I can show that off too. There's this little control board back here. I think it's called a woodpecker. It's in a little plastic case, but this has got um, it's got quite a bit of functionality. There's, a, there's a, you can see there's a bunch of ports that aren't even hooked up yet. Um, this thing does not come with an emergency stop. It doesn't come with. Let me turn the light on. You might be able to see that a little better. So it's a. This is a pretty simple, I think it's running um, software called Gerbil, G-R-B-L, uh, but it has a bunch of features on this board that aren't, aren't taken advantage of by the hardware that comes out of the box. Um, one of the things it for sure does not do out of box is mind the, the limits of the workspace. A lot of 3D printers have this built in, a lot of CNC machines have this built in, this one does not. So, I can maybe show you what happens as a consequence of that. Ooh, this probably hurts the machine a little bit, but I think it's fine. For demonstration purposes. So, you know what, I'm going to take this bit out real quick. I don't want to break a bit. I don't want to hurt the machine too much. So if you're not familiar with CNC machines, this is the this motor is the spindle. Um, this is a bit in the collet. 
It's a little different than a drill in that it's not meant to just like drill a hole, it's meant to, you know, power up a channel. It's meant to get run around on a board. So like you've got a little, like you see on that camera. It's interesting, these, um, these bits, they kind of look like drill bits. But they're really meant to like carve out material. And I probably just broke it by dropping it, but that's okay. One of the things I learned reading about this machine is um, buy lots of spare bits because you're going to break them. So, but I don't think I broke it, so I'm going to put that bit away for now. Let's see. I'm all plugged in. Let me load up the software that I use with this thing. Thank you. I think it's on. You can't see me doing this because I'm doing it off screen. Oh wow. OBS says I'm overloading uh, encoding. I wonder if I'm uh, killing it with milk drop there. But what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to find. It's been a, been a month or two since I last played with it. Yeah, there it is. Let's, um, go to the desktop view. Actually, I wonder if I'm throttling my CPU with, uh, heat. It's a little warm today. Anyway, what I'm looking for... ...is this software. UGS. I thought the uh, binary was like right here in the top folder. I guess that was maybe it's under bin. So this is called Universal G Code Sender. And it should connect to the, to the, uh, to the machine. Oh, yeah, my laptop is throttling at 44% C max CPU. I wonder if it's a little too hot. This is the problem I was having last summer when I was trying to do streams, is the laptop would throttle down the CPU. So when I watch this stream, it would be a stuttering mess. Yeah, everything's going a bit too slow. Well, we'll see how this goes. I may well end up... Uh, bailing out of the stream early to diagnose what's up with my computer. Kind of frustrating. If it's not, like, super cold out here, this thing is out of garbage. To be fair, I am using a laptop. I'm considering getting one of those mini PCs to run all this. Yeah, like, it's taken forever to launch UGS. And I don't know, maybe it doesn't like Winamp. I think I'm getting some echoes on the music too. Wow, this is annoying. Okay. UGS finally launched. Let me see. Is it going to remember? Where the machine is. Try to connect. Uh, but yeah, you can yeah, you can see this. So this is really annoying, like I'm trying to get things to happen and my computer is just stuttering all over the place. Like it's resource monitor is showing that it's at like 59% max frequency right now. But I'm thinking maybe it's it's heat throttling because when it's cooler out here, that is just like all the way up at 100%. So that's annoying. I don't know what this thing is doing now. It's already a disaster in a stream and I haven't gotten into like what I'm trying to do. It sucks when the window management is going at uh, one frame every two seconds. Anyway, 
Okay, you just try to connect. It's on the wrong COM port. There we go. It thinks it's on COM port 6. You know what? I'm going to try something real quick. That milk drop visualization... Milk drop visualization is real pretty, but... I'm going to stop it for now and see if that helps. It's pathetic because the computer should be able to handle it. I don't even know that that was the cause. Well, okay. So this can connect to the machine. There it goes. Okay. So you can see, hopefully... So you can see down here, this is like a serial connection to this machine. And you can see it's got a bunch of commands, it's got a bunch of uh, settings. and being yelled at by a bird, because they didn't put peanuts out. So, I'm trying to remember what hotkeys I had set for this. Program tools, options, EMAP. So I'm looking for is there are keyboard shortcuts, control shift. No. There's keyboard shortcuts to jo jog the head around. And I'm trying to remember what those were. I think I just like swept past them. Insertion point, yada yada yada, yada 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 yada. Ah, okay, so I did like. WASD. Okay. What? What did you just do? I didn't want you to do that, whatever you're doing. Oh, what a mess. Okay. Let's cancel this. So I think if I do. Okay, it's doing nothing. What the heck? It thinks it's connected. It thinks it's doing things. Okay, let's start from a different type. So, another way to control this machine. I haven't started this up in a few months, or in like a few weeks, so... For all I know, it might be uh, I'm doing poorly. Another thing you can do with this is this, um, this is an off, offline controller. It's a little control panel for the thing. It can control it independently of a computer. So ideally, plug this in, turn it on. It will do nothing. Huh. Man, this might be a short stream because maybe my uh, CNC machine is, is kaput. I think that goes there. Oh, you know what it is. <laughs> yep, I just remembered. The machine is not plugged in. This is a weird thing about this machine. The uh, logic board can be powered off of USB. So the logic board will wake up and respond. But the CNC machine is not actually powered. Okay. Maybe that'll make a difference. All right. That looks different. So now we're seeing different results. Oh, that looks terrible on that camera. That is not doing that to my eyes. It's not doing that off the green. Okay, this is what I wanted to show initially. You can see that on camera. So that's me moving the uh, Y axis with the offline controller. I don't know if you can hear this, but.
Let me not screw with my mic. Anyway, you may or may not be able to hear this on. You can hear it moving. And there it goes. It's almost at the back of its uh, limit. So you probably heard that. You hear that noise. That's because the machine is stupid. Here's the x-axis. You can see the x is moving. And this isn't great for the motors, but hopefully this is what I'm about to do. You can hear that little noise, that's it, straining. And I don't even want to try to do that with the, X, the Z axis because I don't think it goes all the way down. Same problem, all three axes, the machine has no idea where it's at. So it's just blindly following them. Turns out you can add physical switches to this thing. So that when it reaches one of those limits, it hits a switch. And then the controller board knows, oh, that's a limit. I've hit the limit of the workspace. And the controller is smart enough to know, stop moving. And what's also interesting about that then is once the machine has the capability of knowing where its limits are, you can go into the software, which now maybe will work for me since I've, powered, I've properly powered up the machine. I'll plug it back into USB. Now that it's properly plugged in, I can go back to my desktop. I can reconnect. Okay, now I can use my WASD on the keyboard. I hope. Maybe not. Oh, because it's off. <laughs> Better remember to turn things on. Oh, there we go. So now I'm using my computer keyboard. And you can see, you can see the commands flowing by in the serial console there. And you can see me moving it there. Well, if I'm not, if I'm focused on the right window, maybe you can see me moving it back. There we go. You can see it moving towards the camera. We look over. Oh, oh that was the wrong camera view. What is going on here? There we go. So yeah, now I'm using the keyboard to jog it back. I'm gonna do the same thing with the uh, with the Y axis. This is all computer control. Anyway, the cool thing about this is I'm doing it manually. This software can be given a script. And it'll just do the needful with this machine automatically. Now, this is what I want to do. I printed out these things. Printed out a bunch of brackets that hold switches and can be screwed to the frame of the, the CNC machine. Um, this is following a blog post from um, this person, S.D. Perry. I assume it's going to work. It seems like it should work. I haven't tried it yet. So yeah, so I printed these things out. I got the switches. Just this week, I got the T-bolts to like secure it to the frame of the machine. So with all that preamble that took almost a half hour to get set up, I want to start playing around with adding these switches. Um, it's not too complicated. So, okay, so I'm trying to think how to best turn this thing around and show you what I'm doing. <sighs> this, the person who wrote this blog post suggests kind of tearing the machine down partially, but I'm, I'm feeling lazy and I don't really want to do that. Unless I'm getting sawdust everywhere. That's okay, I'll clean up later. Just more uh, reason to uh, tidy this thing up again. To tidy this thing up. Okay, on my close-up camera here, 
I think the first thing I want to try to do is attach this bit, this piece, which is um, it's going to be a thing that trips the switches on the y-axis. Now, if I recall, I did print this. Print the I also did the dumb thing of, um, I tried to 3D print nuts and bolts at one point, just for the heck of it, just to see if I could do it. It wasn't effective. Well, I swore that I printed that piece for under the work table, but I'm not seeing it in my bin here. Hopefully I don't have to 3D print another pipe. I didn't think that I neglected that part. Maybe I did neglect that part. Maybe I should start with a different axis. Shoot. Oh! Derp! I'm staring right at it. It's just off camera. I already tried attaching it. It's on the bottom. Okay. It's this piece. I tried attaching it already. The problem is I tried attaching it with 3D printed bolts. And um, it didn't work so well. Okay. Let's get those 3D printed bolts out of there. Yeah, you know, I thought that maybe 3D printed bolts would be sufficient because this isn't a very, like, this isn't meant to be very robust part. I guess what I'm doing here, I'm trying to get this part off. I'm the right uh, sized thingies. Yeah, okay. So this first part is just, so this is like a little wedgy bit that will trip switches on the y-axis. And I first just kind of want to like test fit everything to make sure I've got the right T-bolts, make sure I've got their T-nuts, make sure I got the right metric bolts, all that fun stuff. Yeah, this is kind of pathetic. The threads might even be stripped on this stupid thing that I tried printing. Oh yeah, it's not even turning. Yeah, so that's a problem. I tried printing nuts and bolts on a PLA, thinking it would be a great idea. It was not. So like, I don't know if you can, how well you can see this, but this is a bolt that I just dropped. But this is a bolt that I tried printing out of PLA. It's not awesome. The, um, this is M5. Resolution of the printer is not great, not good enough really to handle that. There we go, I finally got my screwdriver to bite. So I think the printer is good enough to print these brackets. But like, not good enough to print bolts. Like I pretty much like, stripped out the head of that bolt. It's an experiment. I also tried, um, 3D printing T-nuts. That might have gone better. That might be all right. I don't think the bolts were the best idea. Yeah. I've got, I'm also noticing there's a bunch of ants on my workbench and I'm wondering if I uh, left something tasty out for them. So anyways, here's a bag of metal bolts. 
much better. There's a reason they make bolts out of metal. So I want to attach it to this middle middle stretch. I think I'm going to put it up here. Um, reason being, maybe the cables don't have to go quite as far. So I got that out of the bottom there. I think I'm going to add this to the top here. Because like, because this is where all the electronics are. You can't see that. Let me tip that up a little more. All the electronics and cables are up here. So I think if I add the switches on this rail and add the tripper here, that might be a little better. But yeah, so this thing, this is one of the 3D printed parts. I think I did this in uh, Pet G. This is just meant to bolt in. You can see it's got little angled ramps on either side of it. This is meant to bolt in here and it's going to ride along. And there are going to be switches on either end. And when the when this gets to that point, it's going to trip the switch. So I believe this is meant to be affixed with these bolts. Which, yeah, actually, I guess I can give you a quick little comparison. 3D printed versus metal. You can, you can definitely see the difference. Maybe you can. Hopefully you can. Turns out, uh, this, uh, metal is much higher resolution for sharp edges like this. Okay, so we put the metal bolts in there, and now I want some T-nuts. I believe I got the correct kind of T-nuts. We're going to see. We got this box here of T-nuts. Literally just got this box. Hoping I got the right size for the aluminum channel. If not, that's another way this uh, this stream will abruptly end. Okay. Okay. So well, that's a success so far. The correct uh, T nut for the bolt. Now I guess the question is: Is it the correct T nut for this channel? Oh, you know what? They had me 3D print this piece, which accepts. Yeah, okay. I see. I go back to the um, blog post. This. This piece. The T nut's a little too small for that channel. But. We can slip the T nut into this 3D printed adapter. It should be sufficient to um, clamp it into the channel. We hope. It would also help if I got it all the way in there and straight. Okay. That works. If I recall, I got two of these. There we go, yeah, there's my second one. Which still has... It's still got some support plastic in there. And it's still got some support plastic in there, so let's rip that out of there. Oh, 
hopefully I can rip that out of there. There we go, it detached. That's a weird thing to get used to with 3D printing is that, you know, physics and gravity is a thing. You can't just, like, replicate arbitrary shapes out of thin air. You have to pay attention to how the plastic is forming during uh, the layers being laid down. Alright. That's a fun thing about being like mostly a software guy is you forget that abstractions leak and that all your abstractions actually lie atop a physical reality. It has its own ideas about things. Hmm. But that's what's fun about building things. There we go. Okay, so now I got... You can't quite see what I'm doing on the other screens, but now I got two of these. Little nuts in them. I aim to screw this assembly together. Yeah, you can't really see it. You'll see it when I'm done screwing it together, as long as I don't drop all the parts on the floor. Oof -da. But yeah, so like this has a little channel for the aluminum extrusion. And this has a little channel too. go. Ideally these meet up. Yeah, there we go. So this is going to form like a little clamp when I stick it in this channel. And then screw it down. Oh, I see why he gave advice to dismantle this, because this is a little tricky to get in there. Okay, well, let me try it a slightly different way. Because I can slip this in, it drops down. I slip this in. I'm probably going to not have saved myself time by not dismantling this. I kind of, I almost don't care. Okay, so we slide these up. I need some help from something else here. Slide these up. Ow. There we go. Well, there goes that. This is dumb. Not a smart idea. Okay. I am not a good mechanical engineer. What I want to do... Put the top one in. And uh, put the bottom one in. What I want to do is drop this constantly. Huh. I'm not good at this. There we go. I just kind of want one of these to catch. And it's going to keep it there. And I can get number two to catch. Then I can just slide the whole thing up. There 
there we go. Okay. So yeah, I think it turns out that metal bolts are superior to 3D printed. Now the thing I want to do is like, I don't want this to bang into the rail here. I want it to have just a little bit of room. Just a little bit. So it's, it's close enough to the rail to trip the switches. But not so close that it scrapes the rail. So I think that's good enough. Seems pretty solid. Now. Let's go back to the blog post. And we'll see what the next step is. Kind of going in random order. Also, my head is baking as the sun is beginning to shine on me here. All right, so we put that tripper in. I see, so he even um, shows like a little uh, one millimeter clearance. I think I've got a, yeah, I've got a one millimeter clearance there. I eyeballed it, I can adjust it. Um, so he suggests soldering the wires first, but I kind of want to test fit this stuff. I believe I believe these are the, the mounts for the um, the Y axis switches. And you can see I have 3D printed bolts, 3D printed T nuts. It was an experiment. I don't think the, this experiment was successful. So I'm gonna take those out. Like, it's fine to have the 3D printed brackets, but I think the 3D printed, um... The 3D printed, uh, uh the, the brain failing. 3D printed bolts and nuts are not a good idea. Alright, the blog post. So we show the switches going either direction. I think these things are both symmetrical, but I think the idea is that I mount it like this. So if this is coming this way, if this is coming this way, hands in the way. If this is coming this way, I want it to ride up the switch like that, I think. It like rides up the metal and it hits the roller. I don't think I want it this way. It's going to hit the roller. So this side goes this way, that side goes that way. Now, yeah, okay, I think these T-nuts are a good enough size. So now... I want the metal equivalent of the 3D printed bolts in it. I think these are them. Oops, I'm just going to drop it. Yeah, so now you can see the difference between the metal part and the 3D printed part. Yeah. So you, the 3D printed part is trash. So I'm just kind of dropping the bolt in there. This is more or less a test fit. Make sure I got the right parts. Make sure I can adjust everything before I start thinking about soldering. Because, yeah, the, the goal is to solder wires to this that'll end up going up to the control. The 
but one of the things I want to do, I want to test fit everything. I want to like roughly measure the wire lengths so there isn't a bunch extra hanging out and make sure I bought all the right nuts and bolts. So okay, so here it is with the T-nuts attached. We got the bolts in on that side. Um, what kind of bit are we going to need to drive these? Is this the proper bit? Yeah, okay. So it looks like the proper bit. Can't focus. Okay. So what we want to do... Put in the upper or bottom channel here. Maybe the bottom channel. No, that's outside. I'm trying to think how to best show this. Maybe... Move this camera. Tip it up a little bit. Hopefully you're not looking directly up my nose. There we go. So what I want to do... I'm to get this into the channel here. Yeah, there we go. So you can see it fits in the, the aluminum channel there. And I want to see if it properly attaches once I tighten it down. It may not. I, I may have gotten the wrong team. I'm a little worried about the size of them, but... Okay. Nope. That seems fine. And then the idea is, once it's in there... I haven't, like, hot glued the switch in there. Maybe I should hot glue the switch in there. That's the other thing, is this should be clamping the switch so that it stays put. And the switch is not staying put. So I may end up trying to hot glue the switch into this bracket. It goes in there. It's got little divots that snag on the screw holes. And I was hoping that that'd be sufficient to clamp the switch. It doesn't seem like it is. Much wiggle room. Let's see, per the blog post. Do I have the switches upside down? No, no, that seems correct. So yeah, I might need to... Holy crap, this is getting bright. <laughs> I might need to uh, bust out the hot glue. Yeah, so, so far this is kind of an experimental stream. Oh yeah, the switch just comes right out of there. It's kind of an experimental stream. I don't know really what I'm doing here. It may end up ending in a little while and resume tomorrow or something. This may be a process that takes a little while. So yeah, you can kind of see in a 3D printed part, there are two little nubs. They're not very deep, and they roughly correspond with the screw holes on this switch. At least I assume those are screw, screw holes. I suspect I may want to give this thing some little dabs of uh, hot glue. Keep it in there, as long as that doesn't interfere with the switch operation itself. But that's okay. Really, my goal right now is just to make sure I've got all the proper parts to complete this. So this is kind of a test run. Yeah, like I hit that switch a few times and it slips right down into the bracket. That's no bueno. I'm wondering if the uh, 
blog post has anything to say about it. Trim wires, yada 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 yada. Move the bed, yada yada yada. Tighten down switch mount and then move the bed. Say. Yeah, so there is some adjustment to be done here. Like, um, one thing this machine doesn't have that other 3018s have that I wish this one had is knobs to like manually turn the bed or to turn the screw to move the bed instead of touching the kind of the lead screw directly which is kind of grungy because it's lubricated but that's better than turning the machine on so yeah the thing I really want to do with the mounting here is to Get the machine to the point of its physical limit, and then make sure, yeah, so right here, you can see when the gray mounting bracket hits the front. Yeah, so that's the physical limit. And what we want and I'm going to have to readjust this later. What we want is for this to be... Oh, there we go. Yeah, we want this to be about here. So that when the tripper swings by, it's going to hit that switch just before we hit the physical limit. So like I'll, I'll cram it against the end and maybe back it off roughly a little bit. And I can hear the switch click. So once I have it all like ready to be finally assembled, wires soldered and everything, this will be the calibration I do, is to make sure that this tripper clicks this switch and it's all the way up front. Okay. So I'm learning things. Wow, looks like my head is on fire. I probably need to put a upper uh, over this window if I'm going to insist on uh, streaming at this time. Let's see, we're about an hour in. Probably going to go a little bit longer, I think. So again, the, the switch on the other side is going to go the opposite direction. So I think I want it, let's see, we're going to, yeah. I think we want this switch like this. When it's mounted like this. Right, <laughs> it's mounted like this. Yeah, as both it like this, the tripper's gonna come along and hit it like so. Now let me get the, uh, the appropriate bolts. And then the appropriate T-nuts. So yeah, there's six of these switches, two for each axis. The Z-axis is going to be a little challenging because actually I've got tools and parts that haven't arrived yet. But I figured I might get started on this already. So again, I'm just kind of working this into the channel. Yeah, I think once I have soldered wires to these switches, I'll want to hot glue them into the brackets. It's not like these are going to get a 
an enormous physical uh, force. The thing should stop immediately after clicking the switch. But they just don't really want to be clamped in there. I guess soon. Um, if this doesn't cause too much motion sickness, I'm going to move this around to the front here. Maybe that makes a little more sense. That's the front. So you can see Pipper hits the switch on the front. It's going to travel all the way to the back. Very tediously. I'm doing it manually. This is where the knob would really help. I guess if you're thinking of buying one of these, features to look out for. Because I can't just grab this bed and push it back. It's being driven by a screw. So yeah, you can see it goes back. And actually, as I showed in the front, there's this gray bracket. And the calibration I want is when the gray bracket hits the rear the machine. Hits the rear of the machine, I'm going to back off slightly. And then I want for this switch to be tripped. So then I can uh, yeah, move this slightly and the switch is all janky. Yep, yep, yep. But you can kind of see what I'm looking for. No, you can't see it all. There you go. You can kind of see. I'll get that here. The tripper hits the switch. It's at that position. Well, then I'll calibrate it so that that happens. And I need my hand back. I'll put that back here. I guess this is where I could be using both cameras on either side of the machine. All right. I don't know, let me get that other camera since it's just kind of baking in the sun right now. What is that? Is that, uh, is that this button? Yeah. So this is this camera. There's the back of the machine. There's the front of the machine. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know how handy that is. I got some more to do on this stream to like properly present things. You can't really see much. You're also staring straight into the light. The other thing. Anyway, I guess the other axis that I can try. Yeah, I was worried about giving people motion sickness. I think I'm just. Yellowing everyone into it. Is this even a handy perspective? It's not really a handy perspective. Eh, learn how to stream this. Okay, so that's the Y axis roughly installed. My workbench is covered in sawdust now because this thing's dumping sawdust all over the place. This is in part why my soldering backdrop looks so filthy, is because it's all covered in sawdust. I really need a bigger workbench. And in fact, that might be one of the projects I get up to this summer. Is um, building out some better workbenches. Okay. Like I said, the Z-axis is probably going to be a pain. Because according to this the, this blog post that I'm trying to follow roughly, you have to drill some holes. So like in the z-axis, you can see, um, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, this thing needs to be cleaned up. I need better um, shop air out here. Anyways, in the Z-axis, we're going to just put those tweezers. There's a couple holes here already. There's, there's this hole, and there's a corresponding one down there. Uh, I have brackets meant to hold switches. Leave. Okay, so this is the. I think this is the tripper. Yeah, so I've got this this tripper. It's got little ledges on either side of the print. Meant to go here. And I meant to drill holes into this plastic for M3 bolts to, to screw this in. I'm tempted to just hot glue this on so as not to introduce new holes. Um, but for these holes, these holes are not threaded. So I've got a, a screw tap on the way meant to uh, use these holes. And I think... Which part is this? It would probably help if I scrolled all the way down. The, yeah, okay. The blog post says I can tap thread holes into these pre-existing holes. And then... These mounts... Go in there. Yeah, so like... I believe this goes there. Screwed into that existing hole. And then... This goes here. And then these switches will get tripped by a, a, a tripper here, so... Doesn't seem quite right though, but I guess the idea is when it's sufficiently high or low, it's going to hit this and tell me that the z-axis has hit its limit. That's the z-axis. X-axis ideally should be easier to mount. That's the z-axis, yada yada yada. I want to know the x-axis. That's the y-axis. X-axis. I printed these. Also. But again, I use these um, 3D printed nuts and bolts, which, um, not to put too fine a point, up, point on it, are incorrect. Neat experiment, failed experiment. Take those off. Oops, drop them on the floor. The point of these... Ah, I see. So these go behind yeah okay there we go okay well these are supposed to go here yeah so the tripper for the the x-axis is the, the spindle mount itself there's no additional tripper. I'm gonna mount that back there. In the, then in this picture, since he's dismantled the machine, um, you don't see the gantry or the, the spindle or the screw. I, um, through laziness or whatever you want to call it, have not done that. Also using some like domed bolts, which I do believe I bought.
Yeah, that's what these are. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's a good view for this. I can move you here. Now I'm going to turn off, turn off that light. What we're looking at here, this is
This is where I realized I had a network problem maybe 20 minutes ago and I've been fully uh, muted the whole time. That's okay. You have to remember. <sighs> anyway, what you missed is me being dubious about um, forcing a, uh, a screw to be self-tapping. So maybe you, uh, you could see the silent drama as it unfolded. But I think it worked. There are clearly screw holes now. I don't think I destroyed the plant. But the point is... You get... this z-axis limit switch attached. I'm not super happy with how it's just kind of flopping around. I see there's a ledge there. Should keep it aligned. Okay. There's a, there's a lip. Okay, that's pretty tight. Let's see. Lift Move the camera around. Yeah, okay. There's a little lip here. Ah, focus on the correct thing. A little lip here that keeps bracket wedged against the axis. So the idea being, hopefully, Once I get and get this attached, this will trip the switch. So when the x when the z axis goes too high, it goes this high, it'll uh, it'll trip this switch, and then vice versa down there. So I've got another switch to, uh, to install. And again, so far this is just test fitting. This is really just kind of test fitting because I'm uh, probably going to unscrew it all. And then... hot glue the switches into the printed brackets after soldering wires on. So here I'm just kind of gently trying to get this bolt or get this screw into the hole and it seems to largely be okay tap threads into this hole. And maybe binding up the bearing a little bit. I hope not significantly. We'll see what it does. This isn't the highest precision machine. You know, this bracket clamps the switch in there pretty well. So, all right. This camera mount is really janky. Blah. All right. So, 
The notion here is, as I've explained a few times, but I'm explaining kind of for myself, this tripper is going to get installed whether I drill screw holes or not climb it. This tripper is going to activate this switch and this switch and the uh, z-axis is uh, at the upper and lower extremes. And these switches they have corresponding connections on the woodpecker board. That should tell the Gerbil firmware when it has reached its end. So yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm at an hour and 40 minutes. This stream's been kind of a mess. I'm kind of a mess. I may call it soon. And maybe resume tomorrow night with a hot glue gun in hand. But this is progress. This is progress. Been a lot of interesting experimental crap with this and uh, 3D printed screws. Um, but yeah, I guess just to give a tour of what I did. So. That's the X and the, that's the, uh, the Z switches right here. Um, we're going to flip the printer over. Printer, the CNC machine. Flip the CNC machine. We can see. How do I best show this? I not to move this camera too extremely so it's like to give people motion sick. So yeah, so we got this right here is a tripper lever which is going to trip and I do not know how to move this camera. There we go. So this is the, this is the y-axis. This is the mount of one of the switches. This little lever is going to trip the switch. And then over here is the other switch at the other extreme of the y axis. The switches are not staying in their little mounts. But you can see, ideally, this little switch stays in this little mount and is clamped against the rail. I think I need to screw it in a little tighter. So that's Y axis. X axis. You can see I got one. There we go, you can kind of see that. Uh, I have a mess of mechanicals, but it's so there. Mm. There we go. This is one of the, uh, how am I so bad at moving a camera? This is one of the, oh, I know why, because I got the camera upside down. Let me take it out of its, uh, its holder real quick. All right, so this is one of the x-axis, uh, which is there's one here, and then there's one. Where is it? Oh, well, here's the other one. Extreme close. Anyway. I added some switches. They're hopefully going to do the needful. Um, doot, doot, doot. You can kind of see them. Mm, I am an awful, awful uh, cinematographer. Switch, switch. Oh so yeah, so there's a pair of switches under the Z-axis.
The nice thing about the, the x-axis is that the switches are tripped by the machine itself. The z-axis... This is awful. I'm absolutely terrible at filming this. I'm mostly doing this for my own benefit at this point. I'm just kind of looking at like, you know, the axis comes through and flips that switch. So, it's actually all six switches. I have one more um, tripper to install here. And that's it. Oh, but then there's all the work to do with the software. So once I have the hardware connected, because it's all going to connect to down here, you see, can I show you, can I show me how they label? These are labeled. It's hard to see through the plastic. Look the labels. Well, is it working? Yeah, okay, we got some. Looks like we did, like our network connection just disconnected yet again. Oh, there's the labels, sort of. Well, that mm, yeah, though there are the labels. Okay, okay, this is what I was trying to get. Hopefully, you can see that. Hopefully, I'm recording this. Um. X limit, Y limit, Z limit. These are the connections to which the switches will go eventually. There's also probe, which I believe is for the Z axis probe. Um, you can connect a piece of metal to the board and a bit will come down, touch the metal, that'll tell the machine where the top of the material to be milled is. Because there's the bottom most extreme of the z-axis but then there's also the practical bottom ah that's the other bit i'm looking for stop at some point i want to add an emergency stop button to this which is a button of course you hit big red button you hit it and the machine stops whatever it's doing didn't come with that switch so these six switches This is not one of my better streams. Um, all six switches connect to the back of that board. Eventually I'll hook up an emergency stop switch and that should, I hopefully think, will be a significant upgrade to this piece. Should allow some more interesting stuff to be done. Well, all right. It's been close to two hours of this nonsense. Um, I'm going to watch this later and see how terrible it is. I need a curtain right there. Or else not to stream at 3 p.m. <sighs> anyway. What do, you, what do you expect for free? All right. If you watched, thank you for watching. I've been kind of distracted. I haven't kept up on chat all that much. I didn't see anybody say anything. If you've been listening, uh, watching, trying to make sense of all this, thank you for stopping by. Uh, I might be back sometime this week and um, see if I can make further progress on it. Wow. This summer is going to be wild. Hopefully I'll be out here to do some more projects. Um, hopefully use this thing. Maybe you'll see more... Uh, more stuff like this little carving live laugh lurk or lurk laugh loathe you can make more stuff like that um i don't know we'll see have a good whatever's left of your weekend if it's still weekend for you see you later <laughs>